on Wednesday, on Monday night for our empowerment meeting. Um, we had a wonderful empowerment meeting on Monday night. I was really, really, really blessed to have uh, the, the cast of the divine revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, open up. Gratitude is flowing in, the, in, in our church because of the, the hard work uh, that was put forth to, to bring this um, depiction of the revelation of Jesus Christ to life. I'm godly proud. There's, there's two different types of proud. Pride. There's the pride of man and then there's pride that you have in the Lord. Paul said, make your boast in the Lord. And I'm godly proud to uh, have received um, wonderful reviews. Um, and one of the things that was shared is that it brought the Bible to life. And I'm thankful for um, all of the hard work. I just continue to express my gratitude. Um, when, you, when you're not a prideful person, you know how to say thank you more than one time. Amen. You, you become a vessel of thanks. And as our play dealt with uh, repentance, when you don't deal with pride, you know how to, you know how to express your sorrow and your lament more than one time. And we'll get into that. Amen. But I'm really grateful and I'm, I'm going to stay grateful. If, I can, if, you, if you can get that from me, you, you might get somewhere. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. I hear people who are young in age and then young in the mind say things like, well, I said thank you already. Look at your neighbor and say, learn how to stay grateful. Stay grateful. Man, it's, you know, we, that's like the, what I call a check-in-the-box mentality. Well, I already said it one time, you know, as if that's all it took to help you. It's just a fleeting help. <laughs> you know, that's all it took to reach you, just, just a fleeting act, as if that's all it took to teach you. And then when you didn't get it right one time, you had to figure out another way to get you taught. Oh my God. Amen. But we can say thank you once and for all, one and done, huh? No, I'm going to stay grateful uh, because uh, there was a lot of labor that went into the work. A lot of labor. Um, so many, and, and, uh, and, and it took uh, a lot of latitude. You know, if we could put a number on the many different ways that came across our table meetings on how to get this thing to you and how to get it depicted, I don't know. What, what would you all say? How many ideas got chopped? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, our, our final framework was over 30 written pages. But, you know, per meeting, you know, how many different ideas and ingenuities were proposed? I would at least say we chopped several hundred ideas just to sit with 12. And, you know, so it takes a humble person to come every night and your idea not get chosen. But you got to work somebody else's. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. All of the electronics and engineering and uh, suspension work and, and all of the hardware and software transmission and engine uh, um,
composition in your car is the result of hundreds of thousands of ideas that got boiled down into a few systems. And I thank God that I was working with a crew that was willing, willing, remain willing. And I, I said it, I said it out. You know, they would get all their ideas all nice and cute and compact and this is it. And I come in and what in the world is this? What, what in the world? Y'all wasting my time. And apparently you don't mind wasting yours. And they just looking like But we did it. And we got it done. And we don't give ourselves any credit. We give God all the glory. Because we realize on the first night we can't do it by our own strength. And <laughs> I kept telling them, God, God has a plan. So hats off to the crew of Divine Revelation. I wish there was more of the church here to help me with this. We heard from some, some of the roles. Um, we heard from some of the roles. Uh, again, we haven't lifted up that there were stars, um, but when you boil it down, there were key roles. Um, and interestingly, the Holy Spirit would have it that some of the people that said, I just play a simple role, a non-speaking role, um, ended up becoming supporting roles and key roles. And so we heard from some of those on Monday night, and it was awesome. Tonight, I want to invite two of our key um, characters in uh, to start this conversation off with us so that we can keep pulling from the bone. Amen. So that we can understand more and more and more about the divine revelation of Jesus. So will you help me welcome to the dais tonight? Um, that in the person of Dexter McCoy and Taylor Butler. Welcome to Live at 7. <laughs> Seriously, you all done a wonderful job in depicting um, the characters that you were cast to play. And um, there was too much work that went into um, bringing the scripture. And I always, I've been saying this, that our play is not scripted, it's scriptured. And um, um, the more you read Revelations, the more sense the play, the production will make to you. Um, and so you all brought the scripture to life. Um, you brought the Bible out. You had to play some things and demonstrate some things that um, goes against everything that you are endeavoring to be and become um, in your case, Dexter. Um, but nonetheless, we had to see it to understand it better. Um, whether or not you have read through Revelation, what little bit you know about spiritual warfare, can I just survey the audience and ask, the congregation rather, and ask, do you, as a result of the play, do you have a better understanding of spiritual warfare and of the scripture of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ in spiritual warfare? Amen. 
Um, and in order for you to play that, you had to get an understanding yourself. So my first question tonight, and I'm going to take questions um, from those who are gathered here, but to kick off our conversation, um, tell us your role and tell us uh, how you vamped up, how you prepared, what did you have to do to bring that role to life? We'll start with the lady. She's, she's trying to defer. I did. Um, oh, God. Um, my role was, um, which it was an angel, which later on became more like, um, like the angel, um, like archangel. Strong. Strong angel. And um, which originally was not. It just grew to that. But um, in terms of what I had to do to get ready for that role, um, I had to repent. <laughs> I had to repent to get ready for that role. It was, um, the timing was off. I mean, I'm not gonna go deep into it, but I honestly really just wanted to support everyone this year and help with the core. And it just so happened in the first week, um, like the week leading up to resurrection, the enemy just started attacking me in all different ways and in my mind. And I thought thoughts I had, I never thought I would think. And a lot was going on and pastor was ministering to me. So I literally was in a place where not only did I not think I was worthy to be even an usher right now, definitely didn't think I was worthy to be an angel, well, even acting like one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely had to repent. Wow. Sheesh. Um, so I know for myself going into the play uh, we were asked to, so this is the week before Women's Week, that we all had to audition, and we knew what we were trying to do, but it was, it was on the table that roles would change. And so, um, you know, I, I think I, I might have told a few people, but I'm like, someone else is going to get cast into the role that I played. What role was that? Uh, the role of, of Satan, Lucifer in the play. And I'm like, hey, I, you know, if someone can do it better, I really, you know, I really don't mind. Everybody's like, nah, it's yours, nah, it's yours. I'm like, no, nah, I really don't mind. Like, I don't have to, like, I don't have to do that again, you know? Um, but, you know, the closer, the, the more we went into the play, you know, we never cast roles. We were trying to figure out what the play was the whole time. And then so, like, I remember uh, three years ago, um, the last time we played the play, you know, you and, you and I sat down and we had a serious conversation about, like, the, the seriousness that I should have playing Satan in the play and just, you know, how angry he would be with me using that to deliver other people. And um, I think that I geared up knowing that it was after we got to learning the word to do it, knowing that it was so intentional for me to show you, you you've taught us Satan has no new tricks to show the people Satan's tricks so that they see them and they know the tricks. And so that's kind of how I geared up, like being really intentional, knowing that, you know, for myself, it was really important that I understand for myself and then help other people too. That's excellent. I forgot about that conversation, but it sounds like a conversation that I would have mm -hmm. because, um, as we have heard, art can imitate life. And um, if you have um, any knowledge of actors who have shared post their roles in movies, um, particular, um, who have shared how hard it is to de-role. Yeah. <laughs> to de-character. Yeah. Um, 
that there takes a a lot of contemplative work to get in character. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the actor right offhand. I want to say I should have done some research. I didn't think I would come here with this tonight. Um, I think it's Denzel Washington, yeah. but I'm not sure. But I remember hearing how um, a, a, a well-respected and well-regarded actor would get in character, not just for the film filming process, um, but for the entire production process. So not just when it's time to film, but um, a lot of these films take place over three months. And instead of dipping in and out of character, he stayed in the role. During the breaks, during the, um, the nights off, <laughs> you know, came in character, left in character. And when you do that for so long, you could be changed <laughs> by your character. It only takes 21 days to make a habit. Whew, my Lord. Um, that's frightening mm -hmm. when it comes to your character. Yeah. Not so much yours. And keep that <laughs> <laughs> Here we are, believers, um, having to or choosing to demonstrate what unbelief in its worst, worst, worst state of being is. Demonic, doubt, discouragement, and to be cast, you know, as the, um, the leader of all of that, you know, to lead the effort to make people not believe, uh, to lead the effort to make uh, otherwise dedicated spiritual church working, serving people um, dilute their Christ, um, to, to lead the charge um, against um, against the wishes of Christ and the confessions of Christians in a whole faith setting. We demonstrated that there was an attack not on the streets, but on the church. Yeah. I want to ask you, um, how did Taylor, his role affect you and how did your her role affect you? Ooh, um, um, it affected me because I had to look at the ways in our church that the enemy has affected us. And I had to understand how the enemy has affected me even in our church. So our pastor always teaches us that we should not let the enemy use us as a tool. So um, I had to understand that and how hard he was coming to depict that so I could also be available for God and the scripture and then pastor interpreting it to kind of mold me into something to go against it. Because it's like, how can you fight against something and really bring forth whatever God is trying to get to you if you don't understand the attack? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how it affected. How can you fight if you don't know you're fighting? Right. Yeah. Right. So just to really get all the good out of it, his role affected you by fill in the blank? Uh, exposing, like exposing me to me so that I knew how to pray or I just know I knew how to push it. Now, let me understand what that means. Seeing, sharing the stage with Satan himself exposed Satan in you, to you? Yes. Um, okay, so when you say it like that, right? 
That's how she said it. I mean, right? it's yes. Okay. But so. it does take on a whole other <laughs> meaning when you hear it like that. Yes. But it's still like I don't. It's still a, it's still true because you don't realize what you're doing until you see it depicted. And then when you see it depicted, now you're like, okay, now I know how to pray. So on the prayer line this morning, you know, plug, we got prayer every morning at 7 a.m. on Wednesdays. Every week, every week, every morning on Wednesdays. Um, and you know, um, I can't remember who it was that was praying, but they started praying, you know, the scriptures and about the different churches and different things. And it's now we know how to pray to fight those things. It was you. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, amen. But yes, but so, yeah, like in order for me to play the angel and come in and literally be able to take in the scripture, I had to pay attention to the way he was coming. I had to pay attention to what, like how he was attacking. I don't, yeah. And in real life, I R L, in real life, have you not been paying attention? I thought I was. I thought I was. So the answer is no. No. Okay. I was getting, I was getting played low key, <laughs> you know. And so that's why, that's why this revelation is a revelation, because mm. it revealed mm. things you never saw before. And it's like if you don't take that revelation for what it is, just like the scripture it says, pretty much you won't be saved. You will miss the grace. So. In real life, have you not been paying attention? You know, perhaps, but not enough. You know, I mean, like, I really want to tease that question out because it's more than just a talk point. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's low key serious. You know, in real life, um, outside of seeing Satan in the form of a physical character or role or being, you know, have we not been paying attention to the wicked activity mm. yeah. and the wicked working. And sometimes, you know, you can just leave it up to the preacher and your church experience to talk about that, not even realizing that there's so much wickedness in your everyday context of living that is not just a spiritual or churchy thing, you know? Um, that distractions persist because we don't know how to uh, rebuke them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Um, like we were having all those interruptions all of a sudden mm -hmm. after an hour, of, hour and a half of being on Zoom um, you know, I asked one of our elders to come and just really cap it off. And when, when, when here she comes mm -hmm. and all of a sudden spotting, I'm spotty, she's spotty, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it had never been a problem up until that moment. Yeah. But what it would, when you realize it and you call it out, what, would, what it would make you do is be more attentive. Mm-hmm and not less than. Mm -hmm. Because what you're saying is that, oh, if it's a distraction, then I need to meet that distraction with focus. Right. Ooh. How many of you all are meeting your distractions with more focus? Jesus. You know, when you think about the fact that you paid for a course, mm. that, that money wasn't available for you to take, but the money or the favor or the help or the yeah. loan got met, the need got met. Yeah. So then the enemy says, well, the next, if I couldn't keep you out the door, I got to distract you. Then I'm going to kick you out the door. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, how many of us have been kicked out the door? <laughs> you know, I got in it. And I needed to pass through it, but I couldn't stay in it. Come on now. Is that a result of spiritual? Work? Is that a demonic thing? I, I would take a shot at that and say that growing up in church, um, that, you know, we haven't 
done a good job of keeping that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal in the forefront of our minds and like we just get so used to seeing other people's mistakes that we don't say to ourselves hey this this if it is not a fruit of the spirit what is it you know like because the world is already so polarizing so why do we try to find the middle in everything else instead of saying demon god you know but we find the middle everywhere you know i do it we we all do it like but it's you know the play showed it so black and white so black i mean you either you either are faith and pierre or they own you <laughs> well and what roles were that so that's miracle which was the youngest of the family mm -hmm. and pierre was the pastor mm -hmm. you either them two or they own you the demons are on you you mean to tell me you can't wear white and black that he said all white i had on all white he said we're all white all white you can't wear black on the bottom you can't wear white on the bottom and then black on the top nah. even my boots was white you 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 can and you, people do you can mm -hmm. but you are then acting in ignorance that you're not fighting something because if white is cold and black is hot, then you look warm. Or black is cold and white is hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you mix it together. Uh huh? If if white is all the way on this side of the fence, yeah. And black is all the way on the other side of the fence, and you meet in the middle. Huh? If white is the actual color of paint and black is the actual color of paint and you mix them together, <laughs> it changes color. It you changes either color. are going to sit on the fence, live in the gray, yeah. or be lukewarm. Yeah. And, you know, I want, and this is just because I did it, I want in, in your free time, if you get a chance, to understand, like when I said Laodicea, that meant the lukewarm church. Mm. All Let's go there. Let's go there. Let's just, <laughs> see, that's why I got my Bible. <laughs> in the Revelation already. I had it. Revelation chapter three. I had it on there. That's why I got my Bible. Mm. Now, this don't mean that, I, that we do the work for you. So you still got to go back and look at this for yourself. My Lord. It's not three, my friend. Oh, it's three and three fourteen. And 14. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let you read it. I just want to read with you. So, uh, Laodicea, for those of you that remember, was um, Tayshawn in the play. And um, let's give him a let's give him. A, you know, I hate to give you a hand for this, but but it helped us. You 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 helped us. In your demonstration of Laodicea. Yep. And Amen. so 3 and 14 says, and this was John, the angel talking to John, mm -hmm. which was crazy in itself. But it says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. And the angel says, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. Mm. I wish that you were one or the other. Mm. But since you are like lukewarm water, mm. neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Mm. You say I am rich. Mm. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched uh -huh. and miserable and and poor and and blind and and naked. Yes, sir. My Lord. Now, if we uh, get to replay this play, my Lord, you got to come to where we're gonna do it again because we had that scene worked out. And we just ran out of time yeah. to demonstrate this confrontation yeah. to show you what a rich-looking, poor, 
person looks like. Miserable. 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 Blind. Blind. And naked. Wretched. Yeah. And naked. Right. Naked. <laughs> Look like. And that's the only thing that I hate that we didn't get to do. All right. Is to show you what that looks like. My Lord. Because but, you might have been looking at you. Okay, my bad. I was about to say, you know, but we see it all the time. You get on Instagram, okay, okay. and you see people with, like, you know, they not, they not happy like that. Oh, I don't God. care what you got, bro. They look, they look like they living, but. If you have been on that side of the fence, you know all that money don't make you that happy. Come on now. I, I'm just, you know, I, by, by a little bit of thousand dollars, I'm gonna tell now. you. <laughs> it, you know what I'm saying? It, you you be thinking you having your way like that. He says a little bit of thousand. You know, but it doesn't it doesn't equate to it, you are really. Yeah. Miserable, poor, blind, naked, and wretched. But you in Bali. But you in Bali being rich. Bali. Oh. Oh, in Bali, yeah. Oh, in yeah. Bali. Looking happy. Yeah. You could have just went to Lake Wiley. Yeah. <laughs> and been balling in Lake Wiley. That being broke in Bali, y'all ain't saying nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all ain't saying that to me. <laughs> Glory to God. You might not have a yacht, but you can get on a jet ski. Yeah. Right, come on, I can get on and still prosper. Right, yeah. Okay. Amen. Because I'd rather get there when my mind is there. Come on now. Huh? Why I'm going to take somebody that's cheating on me in Greensboro to Greece? Hoping that we have a good time. Hoping. <laughs> you was blind. Come on, somebody. That's too far to go. That's too far, yeah. So much, so much, so much, so much. Um, you brought out, and I know you still haven't answered how her role affected you. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't forgot that. But just because we're here now, you brought out that we should be reminded of the weapons of our warfare. And you know, as 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 you recall that scripture, it, it helps me to know that or realize that we only think about our spiritual weapons when we're in a spiritual setting. Yeah. 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 That we don't shout on Tuesday. And we don't worship on Wednesday. You know, we will wait for a revival to bring spirit into our weekday. Not realizing that there's weapons on both sides. And I'm not talking about physical AKA 47s. I'm not talking about steel knives. I'm not, I'm not talking about um, addictions. I'm talking about the fact that whether you use your weaponry in the spirit or not to fight, you are still on a battlefield. And the enemy is constantly pulling out his quiver. Constantly of weapons and bows and arrows. The scripture calls them fiery darts. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, and when you think about a, a dart, right? And you don't think about this too often. <laughs> when you think about a dart, it's targeted. Yeah. 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 It's meant for one thing. It is intentionally directed. And if you're really good at shooting darts, you don't miss your target. All right. My Lord. Oh my Lord. That's tough. And I'm not I'm not I'm not here to glorify the work of the enemy, but I am here to help you to understand that if all he does all day is shoot darts. All right. <laughs> you know, no wonder why you can experience victory for three days and be afflicted in one thought. And start doubting. 
because he hit he hit a sore spot. You know, he hit. Watch this, a unsurrendered spot. Okay. He hit an unrepentant spot. All right. Okay. And I I essentially believe that the enemy is aware of our weaknesses. And he just waits for the most opportune time to, to, to trample on them. He waits for the most opportune time to take advantage of them. He waits for the most opportune time. Like I honestly believe that if we're thinking about the weapons of our warfare, the enemy on a Sunday like last Sunday, or shall I say the last three Sundays, right. I, I believe that the enemy will, 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 will prance in here and say, you know what, this ain't a good week. This ain't a good week. This ain't good. We gonna just, you know, we gonna we gonna just wait. Let, yeah. Let's just wait. Let's just wait, cause you know they 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 got they got too much revelation right now. Yeah. Let's just wait till they stop reading and stop praying. Let's wait till they forget. <laughs> you know. Let's just let's wait 60, 90 days. All right. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. My, oh my lord. We're just gonna hold on to our bows and our arrows. Mm. Huh? We, you know, right now they're too focused. It's the beginning of the semester. All right. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You know, right now they're too willing. It's tax time. They, they, they don't mind paying tithes when it's an abundance. <laughs> Look at somebody and say the devil is waiting on our weakness. My God. He is waiting on the most opportune time to catch you on the battlefield, but without your weapon. And the enemy knows, okay, right now the revelation is fresh. The people are being changed. It's more than a play. Yeah. The Holy Spirit told me these last three weeks, God told me this this week, I, I was like, whoa. He said this was a revival that you didn't even know you had planned. So the enemy said, well, revival time, I might get exposed. So let me hide. But what happens when the fire goes out? The revival stops. When the lamp stands. My God. And that's in the Revelations too. Yeah. Huh? That lamp. Yeah. That lamp. Yeah. That lamp. I want you to ask somebody to left or right of you. If you not, you have to reach down to a person beside them and ask them, "Is your fire still blazing? Fire still blazing. Blazing hot. Blazing hot. Now these are rhetorical questions, but I want you to really sit with it." What is going on with my candlestick? Oh, come on now. What's going on with my candlestick? Why is it out in the wind? Why is it out again? Out in the wind. I said that thing out in the wind. What is going on with my candlestick? There was a time where I wouldn't come to church by myself. There was a time where I wouldn't sit on the back row. There was a time where I didn't want to be late. There was a time where I wouldn't come without a pad and a pen. There was a time where I just would not be lazy about this. But now it's kind of sort of just, mmm. You're not a blaze, you're an ember. Hear me, come on, push past your distractions right now. Because even though I'm in this chair, I'm still preaching. You know, can I kick my feet up and preach? You know, you were once a blaze and now you are ember. Hold on, Terrence. If that conversation ain't important, I want the, I, this is a revelation coming. This is y'all be quiet and listen. If, if, if you are not a blaze, you are an ember. If that. And see, some of y'all don't have fireplaces, so you don't know what an ember is. 
you know, Ember, it, just, it kind of comes on and off. Them coals. And when you when you start, you know, when, when all you see in the fireplace is embers, you know what that means? The fire is going out. Huh? And I'm not saying that you not, I'm not saying that you not lit. I'm just saying that you just warm, you not you, hot. You saying, you get, you saying they got to be stirred up. Oh, my God. Some got to be active. Got to stir them See, you, coals up. You build bonfires. Yeah, we had a we had a fireplace in our home for heat growing up. That was the central heating Look, in the home. <laughs> he said that like that was supposed to be something, you know. No, a lo I know a lot of. I realize we're in a we're in a society where most of our fireplaces are for decoration. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, he, he reminded us the original intention. Yeah. Of having a fire in your house. Yeah. Was to heat the house. Okay, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> so uh, you had to you you would get out of out of school. God, I just got a whole revelation. <laughs> <laughs> you, I you just it. got a whole revelation. <laughs> that thing about messed me up. I'm sorry. Glory to God. Because what if most of our fire right now is for looks? <laughs> oh my God. You know, I, you know, that's the only thing. I, you know, I got two fireplaces in my house, and one of them is gas, and one of them is a natural fireplace. And I said, I told her when I first moved in, I said, how much it costs for me to rip that gas out? I need something that's going to be hot. I don't need something that's just going to look good. And when I think about what that means in the spirit, the Bible says that you can have a form of godliness, but it have no power. Some of us might be on fire, but we not hot. All right. You know, in those new construction houses, they have a fire, but it's behind the glass screen. Yeah. And you realize it ain't for, it's not for heat. It's not for heat. Which means it's burning, but it's not hot. No. Yeah. It just look hot. Some of y'all look hotter than you really are. All right, sir. Oh my huh? God. Help me, Holy Ghost. You shout good. Huh? You dress up good on first Sunday. Huh? We play real good. We can play and we can make people jump around this church and about break their neck and our neck is stiff as it want to be. Oh God. Oh God. I'm going to go old school for just two minutes. Look at somebody. Get up and tell somebody it's time for you to catch on fire. We used to sing that song. Somebody needs to catch on fire. Catch on fire. Catch on fire. Somebody needs to catch on fire and burn with the Holy Ghost. Y'all don't know it. It's too, it's too old school for you. There ain't enough, ain't enough jazz chords in there. You, it's just straight Holy Ghost. I mean that. I mean, let me sit back down. We're supposed to be having a little panel discussion. But, you know, like... <laughs> You know, and I'm. You know, I don't want to be churchy tonight. I want to be. I, I, I want to be righteous. What does it mean to catch on fire? What does it mean to catch on fire? What does that actually look like? I, I got some answers, but I just want to see what y'all think about it first. You know, because we can be like, oh, oh God, yes, catch on fire. <laughs> it sound good. It preach good, but do it live good? What does that mean? If I'm, I'm not even from that kind of church, Pastor, so we didn't talk about fire. <laughs> I'm not even from that kind of church, Pastor. You, I, you know, we, we didn't talk, we talked about water baptism. But how many of you all remember your pastor saying, now that you've been baptized in water, now you get baptized in fire? How many came up and heard your pastor say that? I got like three, three hands. And some of them right here, I'm your pastor. So, <laughs> you know, we don't talk about that. And then we get to a book of Revelation and we see the use of fire not being guiding light, 
not being salvific symbols, but now we see fire as being destruction. And I remember, uh, God, man, I remember, shoot, maybe about uh, at least 15, 16, 17 years ago, um, I preached a revival in High Point, North Carolina, and I was talking about how the different ways God uses fire. And so, you know, if fire can be destruction or salvific, obviously I want the kind that's going to lead me to Christ not cause me to live in hell and continually be burned by it. What are you saying, drum right? I need to catch on fire. You need to go back to reading your word. And the Holy Spirit lets me know some of us never started. You never actually made the Bible an authority in your life. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Think about all the other things that we allow that were that is written to influence us. We made Pythagorean theorem. Oh my God. An authority. Yes, we did. Uh huh. Huh? We made the the laws of gravity. We made Newton's laws. All right, sure did. Made his Come on, talk back to me yeah. now. Right. We made an authority. Yes. Huh? We made Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. An authority. Right. We made poems. Uh huh. Huh? And poets' words. Mm -hmm. An authority. Don't get me started in entertainment. Oh, my God. We let somebody's raps yeah. and rhymes yeah. and runs, and runs yeah. influence how we think. Sure you know, I said it a few months ago. Some of us are so dependent, you know, on, on our favorite artists to release their next record. What you're really doing is come out with something new so you can tell me how I feel. So you can tell me how I feel. Oh, I can't turn this off, man. It just it, that thing. That's all you doing. We have made our biography books and um, our history books and our psychology books. We will literally get in psychology and start reading about how man has figured mind to work and don't even know enough scripture. Yeah. about what the word of God says about our mind I have not given you the spirit of fear but of power of love and a sound my be ye transformed we don't even know what the word says and we wonder what it means to catch on fire. Well, if you ever want to, first thing you got to do is you got to get in relationship with the very mind of God. You got to read it when you don't understand it. <laughs> You got to read it when it don't make any sense to you. You got to study. You can't just, you can't just read. Huh? And the thing about this is, it is, is that this classroom don't ever close. So you can take all the time you want to, as long as you keep learning. Grow in the and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Nicki Minaj. Huh? Huh? Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Benjamin Franklin. Because you know more about money than you do ministry. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we got to think about the fact that it is a shame that we don't actually have a fire about this thing. Okay, what else you got to do to catch on fire? Okay, because there's something coming up next week. When is the first? Monday. Monday. <laughs> Look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I mean, I think it's providential because rarely does the fast yeah. is the first on a Monday. Oh, right. And we fast the first Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of every month. So if the first is on Wednesday, we won't fast until the next. We fast on the first Monday. Yeah. Am I making sense? But as the Holy Ghost would have it, for the purposes of this reminder, uh -huh. it's hard to forget when to fast this, this next month. Because Monday is the first. And here we are in the fifth month, May, and either you haven't fasted or you started and you stopped. How are you going to catch on fire, you know, if you can't do the simple things? Some things come but by prayer and fasting. We get on the prayer line every week. You know, it's good to see y'all all out here. It's good to see you out here. But it wasn't this many people on the prayer line this morning. Hmm? Hmm? As a musician, when do we pray? We play for prayer and don't even pray before we play. And we think about this world that we're in of musicianship. And it's crazy because we talk about a world of musicians that play for what? Church. Church. And then all the shedding and in all the conversations that we have, how much spiritual life do we bring to our spiritual work? Like, like as musicians, we can't get cancer too. Like as musicians, we don't have a soul too. You know, and that's what the enemy wants. He wants us to work our way and be too busy to be saved by the spirit. That, that we actually help. Wow. Amen. The fire of God is so important and the scriptures continue to lead us down that path. Look at your neighbor and say, stay lit. Stay lit. Can you answer my final question? Did, 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 we, did we finish about Laodicea? Did, did we get the point out of that? I think they can. Oh, yeah, we did. We did. Because it talked about yep. lukewarm. Mm -hmm. and then, yep. How were you impacted by countering the role of an angel? So um, I'll say that l because that was just a, it was a different dynamic from this play and last play. Again, I just want to reiterate that we started this play with the understanding that we were redoing the play from 2019. From 2019. And so, you know, there were no angels in that play. It was just prayer. And to see what the prayer, you know, what the prayer enabled, what the prayer like brung into the room, okay. you know, that was big. And then I'll, I, I wasn't really trying to fast forward to end. I was trying to find something in the middle. But, you know, when purely being in character, we, we kept reiterating for production purposes only. When she was telling me to bow at the end mm -hmm. and I was like, no. But it's like, even when I was saying no, I knew I had to. Mm -hmm. And then so when she said, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
like the way that all came together was so fast but when we actually enacted it like it was just me personally it was like dang like when you when when we which were the people chose that they were gonna repent i had to bow Mm. like it wasn't it wasn't no choice when she said in the name of jesus christ you will bow but you know he he put that in there because that wasn't a part of our script that we worked on and then he said no you got to tell me in the name of jesus christ Mm -hmm. (laughs) so you knowing that you have to bow but you needed to hear jesus christ's name in the name of jesus you got to bow yeah and we went over that like I would say ten minutes before the play started, I said, Tell me to bow like three times, but when I hear you say in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm just gonna drop. Mm. I'm just gonna cause I remember you said drop like the tank fight. <laughs> like <laughs> Uh, you didn't drop like that, though. Yeah, <laughs> hey. But <laughs> I did hit the knee like he hit that knee. I saw you. But, <laughs> uh, but nah, to you know, you, you know, I'm 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 a very pragmatic person. So I'm sitting here, and what I'm working through is, okay, I hear you. And I'm a, I'm gonna say that at some point between Thursday and Sunday I'm gonna try it in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan. But I'm thinking, is it that simple? Is that all I have to do? Is just you know if I'm a baby in Christ out there, is that all, that's all I gotta do? Is just that's the I just gotta adopt that language. You gotta have the authority. You beat me too. <laughs> I can't just cut and paste. Yeah. And win warfare. The thing is working on me because we have to make religious teaching real. You gotta believe it and relevant. And making it real helps you to realize that no, you cannot just cut and paste and then now you got it because you will literally be walking around Greensboro and around your job talking about get thee behind me Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Looking and sounding crazy mm-hmm. with no authority. Yeah. Right. No Wonder why I won't bow. Yeah. yeah. What gives us authority in the name of Jesus? It's quiet now. I don't know why. (laughs) I mean, consistency, relationship, worship, you know. Like, the angel was charged by, like, literally, when you go back to the throne room, that's what was so amazing to me. You go back to the throne room, it's like, I'm supposed to be this strong angel, but there was so many, there was so much strength and humility at the same time. So we were, as angels, we were worshiping together, and then we came, came up to the throne room, and we were all bowing and all worshiping and glorifying God and you get the charge and you come back with the authority of God because you have that relationship because you're there with God and God can trust you with this authority to go and handle that business. <coughs> you gonna get on me from So my- when he asked me, you know, you said, well, who are you yeah. to, to tell me that? God sent me. He sent me for that authority. So okay. yeah. Boy, you gonna get on me for my answer. What you like to say? But if you refer to the scriptures, okay, because we gonna refer to the scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> what gave the churches the authority was their obedience. They all had orders from their complaints. If you do this, mm-hmm. I will. And why am I getting on you? Because I have problems with obedience. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, it gives me an opportunity to say we can know better. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and, and not do better. But what you don't understand is that 
that means that you can't even speak better. You know, again, authority. Wouldn't we love for this to actually be a reality? Speak those things that are not. As though they were. It sounds so poetic. It sounds so prophetic. It sounds like something that I want. I want the ability to, to literally deal with sickness and just speak healing. I want the ability to deal with lack and speak uh, prosperity. And we wonder why, and this is a good, this is a really great criticism of our faith. Why is it not working? Why are there people in the church that are still sick? Why are there people in the church that are still broke? Why would I want to join that? Sacrifice my time and my talent for that if I can't do no better than them? Well, first of all, you don't use people as a rubric for your own salvation and your success. Amen. Amen. Number one. Number two, you can't ever look at somebody else's life and just glance at it and not see their journey. Because you could have looked at you, you could have looked at T.D. Jakes, you know, in the 70s and said he broke. But see, in the 2020s, now he's a billionaire. You, you can't you can't. And then you can't even look at him in billionaire status. And get blessed by what you see then, because then you will have missed out on what it took. Come on, somebody. And but. Seriously, we lack authority because we lack obedience. Again, this is authority. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that my people perish for a lack of, we are biblically unknowledgeable. And then there's another instance in the scripture where Jesus got mad at the disciples because they couldn't get a demon cast out. Wait one minute, Riches. What's the question on the table? What does it take to have authority? There was an occasion in the scriptures after seeing Jesus demonstrate this authority, Jesus fell back. And I'm going to let y'all do it. I'm going to let y'all do it. And I understand why, because guess what? As the shepherd of this house, I can't be everywhere your demons are. I can't be everywhere demons are. Jesus stepped back and let them work to cast out an evil spirit. And what happened? They couldn't do it. And Jesus's response and I know this by memory. O oh, ye of little faith. Look at your neighbor and say, friend, I love you, but you can't fake faith. I just did that. I don't know if that went over or if it's, it went in and it's, it's still percolating. I just want you to hear that tonight that you can pray but if you don't have faith the effectual and fervent prayer of the righteous you can lay hands but if you don't have faith you can tithe you can put $10,000 in tonight and you say because of the denomination I know God is getting ready to bless me but if you don't have faith, some people do it to be seen. Some people give to be a savior. Huh? But if you don't have faith, and that's why a lot of our prayers are not really becoming our realities because we actually lack faith. And the, the, when you really think about what it means to not fake faith, Satan came from faith. Yeah. 
Yeah. Satan knows what real faith looks like. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't born in hell. No. He was born in heaven. Ultimate faith. Huh? He, his experience wasn't with the demons and devils that he's working with. His experience was as an angel. Come on, y'all ain't got no, come on now. On Satan's resume, it's not going to be your name. I got experience working with the drum right fam. I got experience working with the orange fam. I got experience working with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. His experience with God trumps any experience that he has with you and me. Satan knows the real thing. Yeah. Why? Because he came from the real thing. He worked for the real thing. He was raised by the real thing. He used, this is the thing right here, he used to worship the real thing. That's why the enemy has more authority over me than I have over him because he knows that I ain't got the real thing yet. Help me, Holy Ghost. He knows I'm singing, but I ain't met the one who wrote the song yet. Oh, my God. He knows I'm preaching, but I ain't really serving the one who wrote the scriptures yet. And that's why Jesus got on the disciples, because they lacked faith. When are you going to start living by faith? The Bible said the just Oh, help me now. The just shall live by faith. My God, sometimes y'all let Bank of America and Duke Power tell you how you're going to live next month. I got to pay my power bill. I can't pay my tithes. You just lost your faith. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a house this month. I can't pay my tithes. You just lost your faith. Come on, somebody. You let the dog go ibuprofen and the prophylax tell you how you're going to live. You let your body tell you how you're going to live. You let your feelings tell you how you're going to live. Some of y'all let the weather tell you how you're going to live. The devil is alive. It's raining outside. You know, when it's raining outside, I can feel it in my bones. Okay. I hope you don't have to dance on the day it's thunderstorming. Huh? Ain't no sun. I, you know, I get depressed. You know, you let dates tell you how you gonna feel. I was talking about this on my boiler room prayer last Saturday. Glory to God for those of us who are in mourning. You know, we don't let anniversaries come back around. If you really are a person of faith, you don't let an anniversary come and tell you how you gonna feel. What if Jesus come back on the same day you planned on being depressed? You know, Papa died on this. You are planning your depression? Just because you see May 3rd approaching every year, you start heaving, you start feeling stuff, you telling your mind how you going to feel. Do you understand, glory to God, that your faith should be able to override your feeling? Glory to God, on a good day, a bad day, a rainy day, a shiny day, a happy day, or a sad day, the just shall live by what it said. I got too much Jesus in me to let, to let a thunderstorm cause me not to be happy. I got too much Jesus in me to let somebody that was going to always die. Hey, I know you love me, but I'm, I'm, I'm if Jesus don't come back, guess what? I'm going to die. And if Jesus don't come back first, guess what? You gonna die. It's too much faith in us to let the let life happen. Glory to God. And make us feel a certain way. Somebody needs to start walking in their faith. Somebody needs to start working in their faith. Somebody needs to start believing in their faith. Somebody needs to start giving in their faith. Somebody needs to start watching, feeling in your faith. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Glory to God. I go on vacation just because I got money. I say, Lord, bless me at every transaction. 
<laughs> bless me at every transaction. Bless me, God. And uh, I went on a vacation not too long ago, and um, I had to get a rental car and a hotel room. And on the same day, the rental car bill, I got back to the airport, and the, the, the woman was checking me out. I was trying to go and catch my plane, and I said, I'm going to turn in the key, but I don't like to just, I used to do this dash and go. I like to see my bill. All right. Because they'll take advantage of you, you know, and I said, well, I'm, a, I'm just going to wait for you. Um, and she said, you want to turn the key? I said, I'll wait for you. And, um, I, I, and so she said, okay, I'm going to be a minute. I said, well, I got this plane to catch, but I got enough time to sit here at least another five minutes. I'll wait for you. I got up to the counter and she started. And she said, um, what's your, let me see your license again. And then she put the license in. And she said, um, who helped you with this reservation? And I said, actually, it's the guy all the way down at the end of the counter. And she said, um, I can't find any charges. <laughs> And she said, now, if you want to wait, I can wait till he's free. And she looked at me, she said, but if you're okay. And I said, she still had my license in her hand. I said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Y'all be saying it doesn't to me. On the same day. Before I got to the airport, I checked out my hotel and I asked for a bill. And the manager said, don't worry about it, have a good day. Oh, I pray that prayer, Lord, at every transaction. And I used to pray at Roman because I was broke. Now I pray it because I'm rich. At every transaction. Give me favor, Lord, because the just, I said the, I said the, shall live by faith. And if you're not living by faith, you can't have any power when you pray by faith. Huh? And so we understand why the disciples did not have authority in Jesus name. Watch this, because they didn't have Jesus' faith. They didn't have Jesus' faith. And we don't have a cut and paste faith. I teach you, I lead you. Um, I pray for God's anointing over you. But what causes me to grieve is that I see that a lot of people around me still don't have the faith that they've been exposed to. We have more complaints than we do comments about Christ. And we wonder why our prayers are not answered. I see people's happiness revolve around pay periods. And that really frustrates me for you. Because basically, based on what you have, I can tell <laughs> how you feel. I see people being more explorative when they're dating. But when you're single, you don't sound the same. You don't look the same. You know, you're not, you don't live the same. And I'm like, oh, so that's all the enemy has to do is just introduce you to what you think love is. It's crazy. And then on the reverse, we could be, 
we can be more open until we get in relationships and then all of a sudden we become secret agents around here. And I said, oh, well, that just, that's just that simple. That relationship ain't built off faith. Because <laughs> if it's built off faith, it would be a light. Uh oh, see, I'm getting in trouble now. Somebody say, Lord, let my love be a light. That means that some of y'all got to fall out of love now. <laughs> huh? And then you try to blame. You know, you try to you, you you try to take cheap shots at religious teaching. All right. But you ain't really even talking about the fact I've been living in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's real. If it's right, your love should be a light. Amen. That rhyme. Yes. It did. And it's real. It is. Come on, somebody. Think about all the secret love you've seen in your family. Huh? I mean, you knew so-and-so had a wife and you knew he had a sweetheart too. Somebody was hurt. Some child felt rejected because of that. Huh? That's the child that they acknowledge. But the other child, you know, we had a lot of that you know, right. in our family, you know, we had the, the child that was, uh, you, you, you know, everybody knew about, and then you had the love child. Mm -hmm. So the love child couldn't get all the acceptance. And we don't even say we mess kids up like that. Yeah. Yeah. We mess kids up like that because, you know, we can't fully, um, somebody, what's, oh, oh my God, illegitimate child. There is no such thing as an illegitimate child. Y'all don't know nothing about that, but that's old school talk. That's the illegitimate child. There's no such thing as an illegitimate child. If a whale gives birth to whales, how are we going to say that whale is legitimate? But that's an illegitimate whale. Oh, my God. What we really should have been saying is it's an illegitimate relationship. Come on. That's what that is. It's the ship, not the oh my God, y'all ain't saying right. nothing to me. But what we don't want to do is talk about what we done. Mm -mm. Well, <laughs> just, the, just, the just tap somebody and say he's trying to tell us to come to the light. 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 And you'll have authority. And you'll have authority. Huh? And you'll have authority. Huh? And you'll have authority. Hmm? And that's the wealthiest part of, of, of what I have. It's not money. It's not credit. It's not cars. It's authority. Oh. My God. I went to a funeral on Monday and there were seven preachers there and all of them had a word. But the family said, you was the only one that had authority. That ain't what I'm saying. That's what the family told me. Come on, somebody. And some of y'all went with me, so you know what happened. You know, that's, that's what, when I talk about being wealthy, that's what I'm talking about. You know, and it took me being broke, but still believing God. It took me having a car repossessed, but still believing God. It took me getting evicted, but still believing God. It took me seeing my whole church leave, but two adults and three kids, but still believing God. It took me having bills that I couldn't pay, but God said, don't you crack, don't you frown, you still preach, and you still walk in the... It took me doing that in order to obtain that authority. It took me, glory to God, literally reading lies about me, and God said, you can't retaliate. And until you understand how to get authority, then you won't understand what it means how to walk by faith. 
how to walk by faith. And I, I, I can give you so many miracle testimonies. I'll never forget. Um, I drove from Salisbury uh, all the way to Charlotte, which is about 30 miles. Um, it was it was it was actually before Salisbury. I drove 45 miles one time on fumes. Wow. Car should have been knocked off. And you know how you know your car? It was empty. Yeah, It was empty. Hmm. Um, been in wrecks. Should have been dead. Should have been dead. You know, this production tanked about a dozen times. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you something. We had one run through every week. And some of you all don't know what that means. But when you do something that we did, you're supposed to have run through it at least a dozen times per week. The, the production was tanking at 1.30. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I would shut down all the plan and we would start praising and worshiping God. Because at that point, the only thing that's going to get us to the end is if I use my authority to tell the devil to get the heck out of my church and get the heck out of my production and get the heck out of our tired bodies and get the heck out of our weary minds. And you know, and, I, and, and, <laughs> and you know, the devil would say, you ain't got time for that. You ain't got time for that. And I had the devil to say, no, I ain't got time not to do this. And so sometimes you'll get to the point to where you have ran out of ideas and you've ran out of time. You can't study no more. Now you just got to put, close the book, shut down the computer and say, Holy Ghost. And I give you one, one more miracle testimony. <laughs> you know, this was, I was, this was my third year in, at Wake Forest. This was the hardest professor in the whole faculty. This is the professor that everybody wanted to avoid. And I found myself sitting in this class. And I've told you this testimony before, but for those who never heard it, he started the semester basically by saying, by making enemies out of us. He said, I'm just going to let y'all know, I don't care what all these other professors do. I am, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm straight up. I, I, don't, I don't give no grace. Either you did it or you didn't. I don't take no excuse because I'm going to give you all your assignments up front. He said, you don't even bother writing me. Don't even bother telling me nothing. He said, and I don't care if you in your third year. I don't care if you in, you know, halfway through your third year. I don't care if this your last semester. I don't care if Harvard has accepted you and, and, and you need to get out of my class in order to get into, to, to get into that acceptance. He said, if your grade is going to be your grade and your work is going to be your work. And on top of all of that, you know, he's an Asian professor. So he's, he comes from a culture that is no excuse and no nonsense. And I'll never forget, we had two Asian students. And the, the, the second one came uh, a year behind um, the other one. And he got really close to me. Um, I didn't tell you this part. The second Asian student came from... Um, Asia from the same place where my professor was from and he got really close to me and he did not have relationship with anybody else in the whole div school and <clears throat> the only reason why he got real close to me is because I felt his pain one day he was sinking he was sad he was taller than me this dude was like if I'm six four he was like six six and he was just but he was walking around like he was five five and I stopped him one day, and I believe I prayed for him. And he cried. And he was like, you know, like, I don't know how you knew what I was going through. So 
as we got close, he explained to me how he thought that he had an ally in this professor because this professor was from where he was from. And he didn't know English well. So he wasn't inept. It was that he just really did not know the language well. And so, you know, you're at a master's level and you don't even understand English as a second language. He's not doing well. And he was like, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm doing horrible. And he said, because I'm not making him proud, he has turned away from me. That's their culture. You know, Asia. our culture is we keep patting all of our dumb kids on the back. Oh, you good, Jojo. You good. Don't you worry about it. Then you know Jojo ain't trying to do the work. He not trying to read. You not trying to get him no tutor. You trying to get your nails done. You not trying to get him no help. You not going to school. You, you working overtime instead of coming in the classroom sitting with Jojo because you know Jojo was a little slow, slow. Uh huh. Too slow. But he can be a little bit faster if, if we work with him. But in Asia, if you don't perform, you mess around get this home. You're bringing you're bringing shame. It's honor. It's honor. And I honestly believe that if we helped our under ki our kids understand how honorable our name is, Amen. it might put more pressure on them to make less excuses. Y'all not saying nothing to me. This professor was no nonsense and I had got all the way to the last, um, the last book assignment, read this book, write a paper, and then the last, um, the final exam. And I had, um, I was like, I did good on the, it was only three tests, <laughs> the whole semester. And a, a lot of y'all think y'all like that. You don't want that. Trust me, you, you, you don't want that. You don't want that. It was like three tests and three, uh, our whole grade revolved around three tests and the final, the final was the last test. So it was like three tests and then a final. The final was the last test and it was three, it was three book assignments. And based on how you wrote for those three books and how you performed on those three tests and that was your grade, okay? And I had done decent on one bombed another one and it was just kind of like that and i got down to the last book and the last test y'all open this book i didn't know what i didn't know what this book was talking about <laughs> it made absolutely no sense i twisted it i turned it and you know what happens when you don't understand and you dig in and you still don't understand you start losing energy yeah. You start shutting down. Chris, I had shut down. I had shut down. And the thing about it was you the um final book was due the same week as the last exam. Yeah, he didn't have no mercy. He didn't have no mercy. He didn't have no mercy. And so I got to the final. I showed up defeated for the final. Why are you defeated? Well, because I hadn't turned in my paper for my book. But you know, I'm still gonna take my final. I got to the final, sat down with it, and I said, oh God, just is it. I sat there for about 30 minutes. This is my last semester. Huh? Invitations printed. My Lord. Yeah. Pictures have already been released. My Lord. And I said, I ain't gonna graduate. And I didn't even get sad. I just had a knot in my throat, a lump in it, but I was just like, just because I'm a pragmatic person, right? So I don't need to start crying and snotting and, and it's just not gonna happen, bro. And it's all right. And I went home, I got up, turned it in, 
prayed and the Lord said, write them. And of course, Greg said, he already told me, don't write me. Don't ask nothing. I'm a realist. And I actually, if you know me, like I actually resonated with that. And I said, when I felt the Holy Spirit forcing me to write, I said, Lord, just tell me what to say. If I got to do this, then it's on you. Not on me. I sent the email. The dean called me into her office a few days later. She sat me down and she stayed standing. And she looked over me and she said, what in the world did you say to Dr. So-and-so? And I said, oh God, I didn't made it worse. I hung my head in defeat. I said, I didn't made that man mad. And I said, what did he tell you? And she said, he's been here longer than me. He sits in every one of our faculty meeting and he basically goes against the whole faculty. He sees things one way. She said, I have never seen him in the state that he walked into my office in. And I said, well, what was that? She said, he looked confused and he said it was because of you. I said, well, I know I didn't messed up now. She said, actually, no, you haven't. She said, he came in here and said, I have never, ever read anything like this before. And he said, I don't know what to do. And I've never not known what to do about a student. He said, she asked, he, she said, he asked me what I should do about you. And I said, well, what did you tell him? <laughs> <laughs> and you said you told her give me another chance right she said I think he's going to come to that conclusion on his own she said but whatever it is you got you got a whole lot of power on your side because that man don't do that he ain't never done it for nobody later on that day he wrote me and he said, Greg, I need three days to think about this. Three days. Cast three days. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you know what got up. So, he ended up giving me um, an article in place of a book. He said, read this article. Write me a two-page paper. And he said, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you accept this, if you accept this in place of your book grade, you need to know that this article is even more complex to understand than that book. And a lot of you all think that a two page paper is an easy go. But when you get into the higher ranks of academics, it is harder to defend your opinions in 800 words versus 4,000. Mm -hmm. At that level, you actually would rather it be a six to 10 page paper. But in a two page paper, you gotta know what you're talking about. I read the article. I didn't know what it was. The Holy Ghost said, go by his office. I went by his office. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm going in the office 
and I'm shaking in my boots because he's giving me another chance and now I'm bothering him. The Lord said, just open your mouth. I'll tell you what to say. I sat down and I said, hey, doc, I said, I'm going to have that paper for you tomorrow. I said, but I was kind of struggling with what the author was saying right here. And I said, I don't think I have a clue as to what he's talking about. He said, well, Greg, tell me what you think. And I said, and I'm, I'm doubting myself. I'm over here in a battle. I'm like, he gonna think I'm stupid. He gonna think I ain't ready. He gonna think. And I started telling him what I think. Do you know that man opened up his mouth and he explained that whole article to me? And the more he explained, the more I wrote. See what the? All right, come on. Come on, John. Come on, John. And he would stop and say, well, what did you think about this? And I said, well, Doc, I kind of felt like, you know, when he said that, I didn't know what I was talking about. He said, you're on to something, but let me explain to you what he meant when he said, I, I pulled out my phone, press record. He wrote my paper. And then turned around and gave me the same exam back that I had already looked at. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah to God. I don't want to frame myself as being righteous. But I want you to understand that I take faith serious. I learned that early in my musical career. Going around, being around all the greatest gospel artists. The only people that I haven't worked with are the people that are Johnny Cup Latelys. And even some of them, I knew them when nobody knew their name. I learned that being you know, in the, in the same studio with major, major producers and major artists, both secular and Christian artists, and seeing how I didn't want to end up. I learned that. I learned that being around major world influencers and seeing how money and power can actually make you the person that everybody likes but nobody loves. You know, like, I, I, I learned so much touching and flirting with things that everybody thinks that they want but don't realize you will trade your soul in. Um, I learned that by God telling me stuff that man was telling me the opposite thing. That every time God tells me something, it seems to not really agree with man's agenda. And as you know, we're working through political crisis and we're working through social crisis and we're, we're working through civil crisis. We understand like the world is playing out and history is being played out before us because we got a lot of people that are, are motivated by their agendas and not by the God that helped them to get where they are. And so I learned that, you know, you don't want power in, 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 in this world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because everything is going down in this world. You know, I learned that by studying how Rome was never supposed to fall. They had the largest army. They had the most money. And that eventually became the epicenter of the church. Nobody would have predicted that Rome would not be here right now. But it's not here right now. And so 
I realized that the most powerful voice is the smallest one. That the devil yells at us and God whispers. That faith is not God taking your hand and guiding you. Faith is God telling you and teaching you and then pushing you out there on the water. And then watching to see what you're going to do. I learned that that's what faith is. I learned, and some of y'all know this testimony, I learned that faith is not being able to look our way down the street and believing because you can see the end. That faith is looking out into the abyss of darkness and not seeing no light, but acting like God is going to make it all right. And I only like that word, acting, believing. Believing that if you can see it, it's not faith. And then I realized one day, everything God tells us to do that we are supposed to do, we never have enough strength and we never can afford it. Huh? And that's and it's crazy because you think that if God requires me to do something, then he would give me the budget for it. And he would give me the power to do it. But the things that we have to do that God wants us to do, we can't afford it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Stop not doing something because you can't afford it. Oh my God. I just, I'm trying to help somebody. Everything I got, I couldn't afford. <laughs> Everywhere I went, I couldn't afford. Huh? The stuff that I could afford, guess what? It ended up being a, a losing investment. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. It didn't get no, I didn't get no return off of it. That's crazy. Put all that money into it, and the car still broke down. Well, yeah. well yeah. let me do that too. Put all the money into it, and the relationship still fizzled out. All right. <laughs> Y'all ain't saying nothing. Come on. I learned that. The stuff that God ties his name to is the stuff that God is going to take God to get me to. I got to pray all the way through this. I got to pray through every, every payment. I got to pray. Lord Jesus, please, God, in the name of Jesus. And then you start realizing, wow, this is what faith is. Doing what God said do anyway. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. You know, and, and, and having a hallelujah anyhow. Anyhow. You know, I had to believe God when I lost my biggest tithers. And a lot of y'all don't understand that context because you're not a pastor. But when you got a church like this and you got all these people, but you only got about 15 people tithing, you can't afford to lose your biggest ones. There's a whole lot of envelopes going in, but they don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> See all these phones coming out, but it's gonna be a good offer. And God say, I just want to show you how little becomes much. You can lose the tithe, but you can't lose the favor. Yeah. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. As we close tonight. Um, can you give us your final word of advice, given your experience with this play? What's the number one thing that you want people to take away from what you spent the last month of your life helping people to realize? Mm. I know it take a little minute. Take away.
We'll wait on it. All of my students keep walking by faith. This is my takeaway. Revelations 22, verse 8. First, I'll skip to verse 10. Okay. One thing about it. Everybody can find this book quick, right? <laughs> Go right to it, like. You'd be embarrassed because it takes you nah. so long to find this. <laughs> Revelations 22. 22 and 7. 22 and 7. Okay, that's the last chapter, right? Last chapter. All right. Um, and it says, Jesus is coming. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things. Hmm. And when I heard and saw them, um, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. Hmm. But he said, no, don't worship me. I'm a servant of God, just like you and your brothers the prophets, mm. as well as all who obey what is written in this book, worship only God. Mm. Then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in this book, mm. for the time is near, and here it is, that the one who is doing harm continue to do so. Mm. Let the one who is vow continue to be vow. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously let the one who is holy continue to be holy mm -hmm. uh, we learned in the last days that there's going to come a time when and these are the times mm -hmm. that we're living in mm -hmm. that you're going to be able to do what you want to do mm -hmm. but um, this book taught me and you've been teaching me for the past five years now so you can make your own choices. See, so that means so much more to me now, mm. you know, because you've been teaching me that for a long time. You can make your own choices, but you don't get to choose your consequences. And your life will always follow the path of the decisions you make. And so, you know, we will be judged. My Lord. We will be judged. And I, I mean, that, that hits hard and deep and raw, but we will be judged. My Lord. My Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I I uh I wrote that on a piece of paper. It's in my car. It's still there? Everywhere I go. Um when I met him he was smoking weed. Like many of y'all <laughs> were when I met you. Yep. And um he came off of it. I watched that process. I literally watched the detoxing process. I watched him about pass out one day at the car wash. I watched, you know, his health change. And um, I found out he hid it from me. I found out he was vaping. Smoking blacks, he went from weed to blacks. And, and I had talked to him, I said, you know, you gotta be careful with these addictions. So the way the enemy's working on you, he wants you to change, replace one thing with another. And just cause you're stepping down, 
it don't mean you're free. And so he stopped smoking weed. He, I said, are you smoking? I ain't smoking no more. Let the blacks go. It's hard to hide blacks. <laughs> I ain't smoking no blacks. And then he got to the point where he was believable. And then one day, one day I looked out my window and I seen him put something to his lips. <sighs> and, you know, we, we went at it. And he tried to make me believe that I knew Jasmine, that he was an avid vapor. You know how that demon will try to tell you, demons lie. You knew, you knew. What I look like knowing? <laughs> what I look like knowing y'all in here vaping too? What we look like? Hmm? And um, was that after I had hid it from you or I took it from you? That was after, yeah. And he found another one. That's what it was. <laughs> I, you had left your vape yeah. and I hid it and you like to lost your mind looking for it and you went and got another one. And, you know, we, we blew up. I took it. And the Holy Spirit said, give it back to him. And I gave it back to him with a note. You can make. 19. Oh, wow. You can. March 19th, 2019. You sure is that long ago? You had to fact check him. His dates. It can't be 20 because that was COVID. So You're right. You're right. You That's good. Okay, I believe you today. No, I just play it. Now, me and him always go back and forth over dates. But, uh, you know. And I put on the note, you can make your own choices, but you can't choose your own consequences. And you're saying this play brought that to life. To life yeah. Taylor, you didn't have a lot of time. What's your takeaway? Um... Uh, in this uh, play, something that I had to keep saying um, was to build the church and to continue to believe. Yeah. Um, that was something I had to put in every single line, like it had to happen. Um, and just going back to just before I was casting in any way and everybody was in here trying out and I was going through and out in the parking lot, you know, we were talking through the things that I was struggling with and you told me that we finally get to see the devil's plan to try to get you out of here. Um, and it shook me because I just never thought that, you know, I, I got know the enemy attacks, but you just never think the enemy can really like attack you to that point. When you just really feel like you solid, you just don't think like. So um, it, took, it took me repenting that next, that 5 a.m. prayer that morning to come in here um, and that, then after that, everything happened. And then once the play started, I had to sit with the fact that we had just came out of the grace made me greater. And now I'm sitting out here in the parking lot, you know, fighting the enemy to come in the one place that I love the most. And, and then I go from that to repenting and then to playing an angel. Mm. So I think, what I would want everybody to take away that I'm taking away in my, just my one of my new spiritual weapons. Um, Grace made me greater. That sermon series was a setup for the amount, the type of faith that I have in the grace that God has for my life. If I can say it like that. I think you hear it and we've heard it, but in this production, you literally got to see and what revelations, what was so amazing in revelations was God literally did all these plagues, all these things, but literally made it so the death angel was fleeting. Like you, you could wish you were dead, 
but nothing could kill you. The scorpions, the beasts, the plagues, nothing could kill you so that you had a chance to repent in your worst pain. The worst hell that God could bring on you, he didn't want you to die. He did not let the devil kill you because he wanted you to be able to repent. And um, I didn't go through a plague or anything like that, but I just went through the, the mental torment. And so the fact that God gave me an opportunity to repent and then be in glory on the stage. I just want everybody to take away that you too, no matter what you have gone through and seen, Grace literally makes you greater. Revelations is your reminder that there is absolutely no hell you could go through that God can't just deliver you from. There's not, there's not a hell worse that you can go, there's nothing you can do wrong. There's no amount of pain you can cause that you can't turn to God and say, I repent, and he won't take the plague away. Come on now. He won't take the pain away. He won't turn you around and make you an angel. He, there's no way. Oh, God. My takeaway was already preempted by how the play ended, obviously, because being the writer, you really got to see what I wanted you to take away, which was my takeaway. However, um, between part one, two, and three each week, the first one was a focus on worship. The second one was a focus on word. And the third act was the fo was a focus on repentance. Yeah. And that's what I want you to take away. That is your recipe. Mm. If you're going to receive the divine revelation from Jesus. Worship. Place an, imp an importance on your relationship with the worship of God, with the word of God and your repentance to God. Dexter already onboarded Revelations 22 and 11, which is what was one of the two scriptures that we put here, which basically said there will come a time, as he said, where he's going to be able to do what you want to do. In Revelation, we heard the word of God teach us about and in this time there's going to be the mark of the beast often referred to as what 666 six, six, six. that's what the word of God that's in the revelation book of revelations I took the cast here and I took you here but I Dr. Cunningham noted it some of you all may have noted it that interestingly now who wrote this book Go to John 6, 6, 6. Go there now. Mark of the beast is the sign of wickedness. John wrote that on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, in Revelation. But if you go to John's gospel, John 6 and 66 is an amazing coincidental reality. What does it say? It is undeniable that some will not be saved. Many will not be saved. It is undeniable that you can get, you will, we will get to the point where you will have no more pushback. You can just do what you want to do and be what you want to be. 
And when you realize how serious this one singular scripture is, you realize there were people then like there are people right now who just did not rock with him and were never going to. From this time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. It would be a shame if the enemy's work prospered in our life and we became those disciples who decided for ourselves to say for me. My takeaway is that sad reality. That if I ever let go of my faith and get in my feelings, that's going to be me. And I can't believe that there are going to be angels that's going to stop me. Because at some point it becomes a choice.